is the head of the pantheon in in Canaanite religion, but Baal is like the cool guy. He's the he's the one that fights the battles and and does all the good stuff and all the texts that we have. Yeah. And, and it's so obvious too because he shows up in the Hebrew Bible as like the major competitor to to Yahweh. Right. Enki the god Anki or or Ea, the goddess Ninhursag. That means like the goddess of the holy mountain. But they're kind of the primordial god parents in this in this story. They do their thing and they have a daughter and then like the goddess Ninhursag is out doing something and, and then Anki sees the daughter and thinks it's the mother and then like they do the thing and then there's a another daughter and they go through this like line where it just keeps happening and happening and happening, right? He, he keeps making new daughters with the one he thinks is is the, is the mother and the mother in her song comes back and says like you have to wipe the seed of anki off you and and so she like wipes it off her and then like these seven plants grow and so anki comes around and he finds them and he's like oh i want to eat that and so he eats them and he becomes deathly ill and and so then she comes back to save him and like kind of lays him in her lap and starts to do this thing and she creates like the the cool gods from him like by taking parts of him and, and like fixing him, healing him, but then also to in order to save him. And Ninti um, is, this is the by like, blow your head off kind of thing, it's, like, it's amazing. Um, so she is created by Ninhursag removing one of Anki's ribs. Okay, yeah, oh no, we're not done yet, my friend. Oh, no. We're not done yet. <laughs> Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And I'm with Professor Matthew Monger from Norwegian School of Theology, the History Religious Department. You got your PhD there, and now you're teaching there. So they must really like to hide. You must really know what, you, what you're doing. <laughs> well, yeah, enough to enough to let them keep me around. You know, okay. it's uh, yeah, it's good to have a job in this day and age. So that yeah. is true. That is true. So we're gonna. We're, this is an interesting topic that. No matter where you go when you're looking at ancient religions, you're going to stumble on this. It's the etymology topic, the the names of deities and the Sky Father and Deus Pater and all this and all these other deities. But sometimes they're not the same name, but you can tell they're sort of the same idea. So I wanted to sort of jump in and try to compare and contrast these ideas, where they all come from, Akkadian roots, Semitic roots, all that stuff. And uh, yeah, and we'll just we'll just jump around and have a good time. Yeah, sounds good. Um, yeah, I mean, like, so this is a really cool topic just uh, because basically we have, I mean, this is this is kind of in, in broad strokes, but basically we have like kind of two or three different, like, at least three different main ways that gods get their names. Because um, gods, you know, sometimes get their names from a place, like a, a place name, right? And so like Ashur is is the god of Assyria. And and that's like the Assyrian patron deity. And and it's kind of like that's the that's the Assyrian word for Assyria. And and so it makes sense. Like that that's that's their god. And and then we have other gods that just kind of have names that that seem to be something about the divine or whatever. Like like the the name El is is a big one. Like Elohim, El, um, and and all the El derivatives in in the bible in the hebrew bible we have all kinds of like el shaddai el Elyon, all these elohim so we have all these el things and it seems like that's basically just the semitic word for god and right. so that like floats around and and i mean it's the same as allah and it's the it's elum and akkadian it's the name it's a gen generic name for god and it's it's, it's all over the place right. um and that's kind of like the, that's that's just more of a connected to the idea of God or, or divinity or power or something like that. But but then there's this group of of deity names that seem to come from natural phenomena or identifiable phenomena in in the world and that these are in some way deified or something like that. And uh, and I think that's what is is the most fun for someone like me who's trained in in Semitic languages is that you can you can kind of jump around between languages between traditions and you can still see traces of a lot of the of the of the thing of the natural phenomenon that was behind it 
And, um, and I mean, and this is, of course, the case in, in all kinds of different languages. And we, we can talk a little bit about Greek and, and stuff like that, too. But since I'm trained in Semitics, that's kind of the where, where I, I like to play around. Sure. Um, and so I, for me, that is um, one, of the, one of the coolest things also about studying um, ancient texts and languages from the perspective of a say a, a psycholinguistic scholar um, is because like we you can, you can literally see these things like we can see how um, things must have developed from the idea of the sun like being a thing in the sky that moves of its own accord that we don't get to becoming this thing that we need to worship or please to make sure it keeps coming back to becoming this powerful being that's the source of all life or something like that right and they they, they notice that plants are growing when that comes out and like when they plants die when it leaves in, this, in the winter time so that you got to think the ancients had to have thought there's some sort of godly power coming from this thing what is this thing we have to worship exactly. it. so yeah yeah and and it's and i mean it's one of those things where where um, you you can see that as we progress through history and we understand more and more things, then there's less and less things that are deified. Um, so there's like this there's an absolute correlation between the growth of understanding of science and natural phenomena and the need to deify things. Um, and so I think there's I think there's definitely a trajectory um, towards the modern world where things are no longer. Uh, deified in the same way so it's really it's a really interesting parallel when you see like i mean when we talk about things like the sun or or yeah or the winds or things like that where we're kind of like yeah we kind of know what that is now like we don't need to call it a god right. um so there's there's definitely something that happens with the increase in in understanding of things um so yeah um that might be why like now it's pretty common to talk about like god is love or something like that like you can the, you know, that's something we don't have quite the same grasp on or whatever. Right, right, right. It's like more yeah. like ideas and forces. Like, yeah. why do certain things happen? It must be the idea. Like, God is love because it's the force that brings people together. Like, stuff like like, right. like Plato talked about in some of his writings. Exactly, exactly. And that's, and that's like also, I mean, if you look at the modern day conception of God, like there's either these kind of thing, it's something love, some force, some kind of thing that binds things together, the universe together, because we don't really get what dark matter is or something like that. So we can say, right. oh, well, God is whatever. Or it's like the divine judgment, which is like the thing that like, we don't really know what happens after we're dead. And so we say, well, that must be where God does his thing. You know, and like that's like it's, so. There's like is this kind of it's those are the realms that we don't understand very well, yeah. and so that's that's what's left to kind of put into the God is is there kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, I mean, but we can we can talk about some of these um, some of these examples that we have from from Semitic languages if you want to. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Like I think one of the one of the I, one of the oldest ones, I don't know, I, think it's, I guess it's kind of hard to say what's oldest or what's not, but one of the one of the ones that is really interesting for me, uh, like having worked with like cuneiform and Akkadian and Sumerian and then into the other Semitic languages is the idea of the sky as, as a divinity. Um, because like in, so in Akkadian, um, when you write, and in Sumerian as well, um, when you write in cuneiform, when you write the name of a god, like you have to put a symbol before the name of that god, and this is a linguistic feature that's used in cuneiform, where it's it's called a determinative, and it's like a symbol that tells you here is the name of a god, right. and so when you put this symbol at the front of the of the name, then you know there's an, a, a god here, and and for the, like in Akkadian and Sumerian, that symbol is the symbol that is for the sky. Or, or heavens. And so it's like literally the the name of the sky god is written like with the sign for the sky and the sign for the sky. Wow. And so it's like and, and so in like in Akkadian we read it as Dingir is the is the name of the uh, the, the determinative and then the name of the sky god is An. And so like you would read this Dingir An but it's like it's just two uh, identical symbols right beside each other wow. and um and so like not only is the 
the, does this idea that the the sky is deified or the heavens are, are deified come in, but it like influences actually the the linguistic and, and orthographic structure of the language because it, it makes you every time you write the name of a deity, you have to put this uh, this symbol in front of it. And um, and so that I shows kind of the importance of of this god as the as the sky god. I mean, it's like he's an important figure in in Sumerian and Akkadian, and it literally means god of the sky, right? right. And so you you get that like there's no way around it, right? And um, and and like this is, I mean, I, I guess like in in within Semitic. Akkadian definitely kind of is the is the language or the uh, the people group that that keeps that focus on on God as the sky god kind of the most. I mean, they have lots and lots of gods, but the sky god has a much bigger place in Akkadian and Sumerian than it does like in Hebrew. Um, so right. if we look at the Hebrew Bible, we don't see a lot of like worship of the sky. Right. Um, that's not really there. But but so I, but I would say there are traces of it, like because I mean, if you read so if you read uh, Genesis one, as a as a mythological text, then you're going to see like the first thing that God makes is um, Shemaim and and Adet, so the 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 heavens and the earth, and and basically these are also just translation. It could be seen as translations of the names of of Babylonian gods, right? Right. I mean, so we're saying like you you know the there's a pretty common theory that that Genesis one is like kind of demythologizing the whole Babylonian uh, story of creation. I'm starting um, to think that. So not not to jump in, not to cut you off. Yeah, I'm starting to come to the, to my own hypothesis that the entire Old Testament is a retelling of ancient myths into a, a into like a, a a new story for a new audience. I yep. mean, and, it's all over the place in all these different books. Like a big example, I think, is Esther and Mordecai. It looks yeah. like they're retelling the the Ishtar story in that one. That one, yes, definitely. I think, I think there's a lot of them that we haven't even figured out yet. They're just like so woven in the in the text, and I think that's how they, the ancients thought they were preserving sacred text, and they thought these stories had power behind them, so they wanted to preserve them and tell them to a new audience in a new language. Yeah, definitely, and and I mean, and and you're you're right into what I'm what I'm working on, and the kind of stuff that I'm that I'm the way I'm thinking, the kind of stuff I'm working on right now, because that is literally how I see the 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 Hebrew Bible. Like I see it as as what, what the way I frame it is reception history. So it's like it's the reception history of earlier ideas, and and basically throughout the whole the whole Hebrew Bible, we find that exact same thing happening, where sometimes it's it's like taking things almost like wholesale and just just incorporating them like the i mean some of the some of the stuff like the sea monster leviathan um you know things like that that just show up and they're literally just playing the same role they do in other mythologies they're just they're just there and and god is battling them and and it's just like okay this is this isn't anything to do with the monotheistic hebrew worldview that uh, you know that we get to at the end of the development of the of the Hebrew Bible, um, but then you get other stuff that's very reworked and very subtle. And like exactly like you say, the Ishtar Mordecai thing. Uh, I mean, the Esther Mordecai. I mean, there it's even the, it's a Freudian slip. It's it, because it is it, it is a, a really clear example of how older things get kind of repackaged and and tell a different story, but that are still keeping elements to make it obvious for a knowledgeable reader right. to to be able to see what's going on and right. and like the the genesis creation story is just like that right because if you want to read it if you're going to read it you know sympathetically as a as a as a jew or as a christian you're probably going to read it saying oh well it's only it's only god you know it's not even yahweh actually because uh, you know yahweh isn't mentioned in in genesis 1 it's just right. elohim right oh, yeah. but um but so Elohim is doing all these, all these, all this creation, but like everything is is done by him. And so you say, oh, it's just it's this one guy or this one God. But if you read it from the opposite perspective, again, you see like you see the heavens and you see the earth, which are both very clear Babylonian deities. Um, and and you see just like each like all these phenomena happening that like it seems like what it's really trying to say is here is 
someone who's in control of all these other deities or in charge of all these other things. And, and it's taking that and kind of saying, yeah, you might have these gods, but our God is kind of bigger, better and badder. And, and if I'm not mistaken, Elohim sort of sounds like a plural name. Yes. So, and Elohim you know, is plural. Because when you, I put mean, heme, you put heme at the end of anything, it's plural. Yeah, so yeah. Elohim sounds like the gods, right? Yes. And it's, Definitely grammatically plural. Yeah. And then you can say that it's used in the in the Hebrew Bible, it's used syntactically as a singular in a lot of cases. But it, it is used in the plural as well. And and so that's one of those things that's kind of I mean, it's so you, you do actually have to go in and do the work and see syntactically is the like are the verbs that are being used with it in the singular or plural, are the adjectives describing it in the singular or plural to be able to say whether it's functioning as a singular or a plural in the in the context. But like when we see like in, or in Genesis one, we we have this, you know, famous, uh, famous phrase before the creation of humans. It's let us make uh, mankind in our image, right? And and when when Elohim says, "Let us make you know humans in our image," then th it's 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 a plural, and we're talking about a plural situation. There's a there's somebody else there, right. and yeah. and and so like I mean, and this is you know this is again really easy to explain within uh, uh, ancient Near Eastern context because right. there there were more gods hanging around and so there's there's no trouble there and um, for, for christians they have an easy out with this because they'll say see jesus was there the whole time <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're, yeah they're out for that one but, yeah that's um that's yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, i don't even want to comment on that that's uh <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know that but that's that's the way it is you know you're always gonna you're always gonna find ways of justifying things i think that's one of those things like bart Ammon says all the time like like yeah you're you, of course you're gonna you're gonna be able to find a, a way around any discrepancy that gets thrown out if you really work hard enough like that's that's just the way it is like but Right. But the the most natural way of reading that text within an ancient, ancient Near Eastern context is is to think of a pantheon or a council of gods or something like that, like not a not a one god talking to his son that is himself. You know, that's. Yeah. Now, but the, when we get to when we get to Jewish uh, exegesis already in like the first second century BC, um, it's it's the the angels that are that are there. And so the Book of Jubilees creates uh, a bunch of angels on the first day um, that that then are God's you know conversation partners or whatever, and and then like and so I would say really what's happening is that the gods are getting demoted in yeah, in just Jubilees like, for gods and they're just called right. angels. It's like what's right. the difference? You know, it's just, yeah. we're, not, we're arguing over linguistics at this point. You call yeah. them angels, or you can call them lowercase g gods, whatever you want to do. Right. But same thing. Yeah. But if they can control the winds and the rains and the hail and the fog and all that kind of stuff, then they're pr pretty pretty divine in, right. in in my book. I mean, yeah. it's still something that you're thinking, now somebody else is controlling that. Like, it's not a natural phenomenon. Right, right, right. Yeah. Now, do you, do you see in any of these angels, I'm, I'm not sure if you ever got into angelology or the names of the angels, but do mm -hmm. you see any connection between the angels and some of the deities from like Sumeria or anywhere else or is it just mm. a whole new thing yeah so I haven't I haven't thought about that actually um I mean a lot of the etymologies are are pretty um are pretty transparent for them for the angels I mean like because a lot of them are are so late that they are formed in a way that's pretty um I guess you know, connected to features of God or features or whatever. And they're like, so they, they, a lot of them end in L right. And say so right. like Raphael who, which means like God heals or healer, or God's healer or something like that. And, you know, and so you get like kind of attributes pretty often. Um, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, Malachiel, that's like the messenger of God. And I, so you get a lot of these kind of things that are angel names. Like through the book of Enoch, you'll find that um, all kinds of different angel names. There's tons and tons of names in, in the, for angels in the book of Enoch. And, and there you do get like this kind of very transparent etymology related to what their function is. So it's like, but, but then again, those are things that you could connect to broader, uh, traditions and transmission of things, but again, kind of demoting 
angel or gods to this realm of angels, but then giving them a new name to to kind of keep them compact within the within the the Jewish context there. Right now, um, this sky father idea, from yeah. what I've gathered, there is an ancient, more ancient idea going back to like you know the Proto Indo Europeans or whatever you want to call them, and yep. they had their idea of sky father, and somehow that got you know, branched off into different Jupiter or Zeus or whatever. Do you, is there, yep. a, now, now Sumerian seems like it's in its own different category with this different language and, but mm. it seems like the same idea with Anu applies. Do you think there's any connection there? Yeah. I mean, so that, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, Like, the, and this is one that, that no, group of scholars agrees on really right. um because because everything is is so hypothetical i guess and then we don't we don't like to say things that are so hypothetical but right. but like the so the idea of of the sky father like is is or the sky god or whatever you want to call it like is definitely something that is that is remarkably similar and and so we have like well i mean because if we look at if we look at like zeus i mean zeus is such an amazing example anyway like i i don't i don't know how much you know about the etymology of zeus but like like you said like jupiter is the same uh like like th like etymology that goes back to this proto indo indo european word like that's like dieu or or dieus or and then you see it show up in india with the Vedic, right. so you you can see there was some sort of branching out happening, but yeah, continue. Right, and it's and it's there in that, and and then it like I mean because it because Proto Indo European is obviously is the Vedic stuff, and then it goes through to the Greek and the Latin and the Germanic yeah. that we get we get all these different forms of it, and so like even Tuesday is a reflex of the same word, so the like so because because the Germanic god Tu. Wow is is the is the like the counterpart of zeus or whatever it and just so hit, when we it just hit me how profound that we were still affected by all this ancient stuff like you say tuesday I'll, I'll i'll meet you on tuesday and like we don't even realize that's coming off of a god a name of yep. a god for the ancient world it's just exactly so wild but exactly yeah. and and like and that so that root, that Proto-Indo-European root, like I think it means to shine or, or something like that originally. And like, so it's like to shine and then it's also then means the heavens and and then day. And it's the same word that's also um, like Spanish, uh, dia and, and French jour is, is also the same, the same root and day, right? So we have like this, there's just this massive connection be between these things. Right. And, and so it's like, but but the thing is that in in Greek mythology we do have another sky god, right? So so the the I mean I guess so in in the typology, Uranus is is the original god or whatever. It's it's Uranus and Gaia, and he becomes heaven, right? Right. So, so yeah. like Gaia it, Gaia is the earth, and Uranus is is the sky. And, um, and so like, they are, they're like the primeval gods in the Greek mythology. And so like the sky God and the, and the earth goddess then become the, the parents of all the other gods. I just thought of something and this might be really far in left field. You might just laugh at it, but <laughs> Ar Aranos, is that end yeah. of that word Anu? Is there something going on with that? At the end of the word A Aranu? Or is that I, just, I, no one's ever even uh, thought of <laughs> I I doubt it, but um, but I will I will I will you know if I ever come across a reason to think it, I will I will remember you and let you know. Yes, uh, but but I, I don't I, I don't I don't think there's a connection there, but um, but it's uh yeah, but it, you know you never know. Um, but a that's lot. one of those things that that you know we have like that. Uh, this is that I the thing that that idea is bigger than the languages themselves. Right. And and that's what I think is probably like the coolest thing about about these god names is that like so no matter what you what you call them like there's something about the sky right and and then there's this like that the sky is this amazing thing and and there must be some sort of being that that 
is this thing or that represents this thing. But then what happens is, right, we have, so we have Zeus and, and we have, it's uh, Anu, uh, Anu in, in the Akkadian tradition, but like, we also get these like wind gods and storm gods. And, and so, and Zeus picks up like these characteristics too, right? So Zeus says that thunderbolt or thunderbolt or lightning bolt, whatever we call it. And, and there's like the one who throws lightning bolts down on mankind and stuff like that. And, um, and in Canaanite mythology, Baal is, uh, is known like by a number of titles, right? And his name means Lord. It's like the literal meaning of, of Baal. And, and he's, mentioned a, a number of times in Canaanite texts as Baal Shamin, which means like the Lord of the heavens. Right. And so he definitely is also seen as a sky god in that way and and has functions like Zeus, like the like other um sky sky gods, wind gods, storm gods do. And so like there's a Something also that happens at like God's, we, we kind of get a, a, a best God or a, a local highest deity or coolest guy or whatever. And, and like that in Canaan is Baal, right? He's like, El is the head of the pantheon in, in Canaanite religion, but Baal is like the cool guy. He's the, he's the one that fights the battles and, and does all the good stuff and all the texts that we have. Yeah. And, and it's so obvious too because he shows up in the Hebrew Bible as like the major competitor to to Yahweh, right? And um, and so like there's there's definitely a polemic there, like that the the Canaanite god that that is supposed to be so great has to you know battle against Yahweh, and um, and so but the the thing is that like we we also have another thunder god in in Semitic. Um, which is uh, so it's called Hadad or Adad, and and that literally means thunder. So we we also have this like thunder god idea that that is out there. But in in Canaan, like Baal absorbs him, and and so he because like, he gets called Baal Adad, and like like you know he's so he's the Lord of Thunder and stuff like that. And so that again, that's like a, a phenomenon that that happens that you get these gods that absorb the characteristics or the functions of the other gods, and and like I think that's a little easier when you have these gods that have a more generic name, like so, like when you have like El or 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 Baal or Yahweh, like if they start doing things that are characteristic for another of the uh, gods, like it's nobody really notices as much but if if like the you know if the sea god yum uh would would start doing stuff that is very windy like it doesn't make sense like you know because that's i mean like that's a whole nother thing like yum is yum is the is the main enemy of baal in the ugaritic texts and so Baal fights with Yom and they're like this. So the sea and they're like, this, this is the main battle of the, of the mythologies. And, and so we have this like um, kind of epic tale where, where it's obvious that Yom, Yom is the sea and Baal is the skies. And, and then Baal wins, obviously, like, because he, you know, the sea doesn't take back the whole world or take everything. And it's, and it's, just like uh, kind of the power of the air and the wind keeps everything at bay so the earth doesn't fall back into the sea or whatever. So it's, um, you know, Yom is a, is a scary guy, the, the, the sea god. You know, I was wondering, why do you think that the writers of the Old Testament decided to throw in these ancient names of gods like Baal and Asherah or even Tammuz and Ezekiel yeah. and sort of make them the enemies instead of like when the, the when we can also now tell that some of these texts are attributed to Yahweh, which were mm. the same gods that they're going against they're You know what I mean? Like, do you think there's a reason why they're doing that? They're trying to distance themselves from the past while also keeping traditions alive. Is that maybe what it is? Yeah. Well, I think, I think one thing is, is definitely that, that they're, that they're keeping like that, that, that there's so much knowledge about the past or about what's going on. Like, I think maybe it's not so much the past, but that there's a difference between the people that are writing the texts and what people are actually doing. And right. so the idea that everyone should be monotheistic is very different than the actual practice of monotheistic religion. 
And so, like, I mean, because that's that's one thing that we know through archaeological finds and through through the text that the people were practicing polytheism all throughout Israel's history. So there's there's no reason to like like think that that disappeared. Like yeah. the reason why it becomes they become enemy number one is because of the idea of of a m- monotheism or monolatry or, or henotheism or whatever we want to call it that develops later on in Old Testament times where they're saying no, we should have only worshipped Yahweh, and and for me that's also important that it's a past tense. So like this is for me is is like Babylonian exile and later there is a there is a growing idea that oh we screwed up right like obviously we lost obviously everything went wrong and then the question is why did it go wrong and that's like the the main driving force in the story of of the Deuteronomistic history so from from Deuteronomy through second kings is saying what did we do wrong how did we screw this up? And the answer is we should have only worshipped Yahweh. Wow. And and then the story of all everything that happens is, oh, they didn't tear down the Asherah poles and they didn't stop worshiping ba- Baal. And and so God punished them. Wow. And and so it's like that is kind of the narrative that that comes for for Israelite history uh, in the exilic and post-exilic times, is that had we just worshipped Yahweh, it would have been fine. And when you read through the book of Kings, when it goes through like Jeconiah Jeque- and Josiah and all these kings, and the way it talks about them is through the lens of what they did with worship poles and did they give to the temple or did they take, they took the gold from the temple and sold it to the merchants or, or they kept the poles. Or this one was a good guy, but he kept some of the poles up. So he was yeah. okay. Like it's always rated on, how he treated religion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and so it's obvious that it becomes a really important thing for for the interpretation of their own history. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that people in ancient Israel were concerned about it. And so like there's that difference between what the elite, the people that were able to make texts um wanted to say is is the reason for things happening. What they told people was the reason for things happening and the actual things happening on the ground. Like, like, I mean, one of the things that people, that archaeologists used to define Israelite settlements from the, from the Iron Age is the presence of house goddesses, like little deities, little, little statues. Like that's one of the defining features of, of Israelite things because they're, because they're just everywhere. And so, like we, we we know that there was this stuff going on, and and what the theological texts of the Hebrew Bible are doing is trying to say, "Darn it, we should we should have known better." Right. Okay. And 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 I mean, and Asherah is also a, a great example because, like, so like up until the 1800s or early 1900s, like basically scholars thought Asherah was Asherah poles. Like it was just, there was some kind of thing called an Asherah pole and that, that's basically it. Like probably some kind of goddess worship thing. And, and then they discovered the Ugaritic texts. And, and so there's a goddess named Athira, or, which is the same as Asherah. So the Ash and the Th are basic, are cognates. So, and, and, and then we found that, okay, well, she actually was a goddess at, at Ugarit, so in Canaanite religion. And so then it's like, oh, and she happens to be the consort of either El or Baal. And everybody's like, oh, wow, okay. So yeah, maybe she was a, a more important deity. So it's the wife of Baal's wife or El's wife or something. That's a, that's a big deal. And then scholars uncovered a text uh, uh, like more recently that literally says Yahweh and his Asherah. And which, which like, which, which is just, a, it seems to connect them also as being in a divine relationship, right? And and then it's like, oh, so maybe, maybe Yahweh was also just, you know, a not a, you know, not the only god, but he was a god with his own goddess wife and his own god family, and and then it like makes you again just step back and say, oh, well, Hebrew Bible is is a Canaanite text. It is 
something that makes sense in its context. And, and then it's like trying to sort out where they move from the idea of obviously there are lots of gods and obviously Yahweh is a part of this, this divine council and this divine family to saying, no, no, it's just the one guy. Like that, that's what's become the interesting question. Yeah. And then on, so the word Ashra sort of gets connected with the word yeah. wife somehow. Is that, is that what happened? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. So like it doesn't, it doesn't mean that. Um, but it's, um, but it's, it becomes like she becomes the wife of the gods. Like yeah. that's kind of her function. Yeah. Got you. Now, yeah. I, 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 I can't help but to wonder because Canaan, we see all this borrowing from the Babylonians and Sumerians and Akkadians. And, but Canaan, if you look at its history, it was part of the Egyptian sphere for a thousand years, maybe longer. Yeah. And it makes you wonder, why didn't they, even as a polemic, you, you don't see them ever talking about Osiris or Isis. No. I don't even know if they ever talk about Amon, really. Like, they don't, they don't really talk about the Egyptian deities. They're just trying to stay away from that? No. Well, so... Uh what I would say is that is a really good argument for a late dating of a lot of the texts in the Hebrew Bible. Right. So the Babylonian connection, we know the historical framework for a Babylonian connection. And, um, and, and so when you have such a polemic, such a strong push towards the Babylonian, then you have to think that we're talking about the, you know, at least from the, from the, you know, the late eighth, early seventh century with the Assyrians and then the Babylonian influence after the sixth century. And so it's just like, for me, that's, that's like a really good reason to say, like, we're, we're not talking about the, the thousands BC or whatever, yeah. when, when Egypt is really controlling the Levant. We're talking like 500 BC here, right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. The more I look into this, the more I'm starting to realize this is not as old as we think it is. Right. It's based off older texts, but this is written or I should say compiled. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, there's, and there's definitely older traditions and there's, there's like, there is definitely Egyptian influence on, on the old Testament. And, and like, I mean, so, and, 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 and it's, it is really interesting when you bring that up because like, if we look at archeology, span we see that there are these seals, like these Royal seals, and, and then these impressions or scarabs or whatever they're called, like these impressions of royal seals that are found, and they show very clear Egyptian influence. Yeah, I've seen those. I, I, I saw the Ankh symbol on the Hezekiah stone. Yes, exactly. I'm so, like, what? Like, yeah. this, this is Egyptian. But Yeah, it's definitely I, Egyptian. But it's also like, I mean, and so that's like with Hezekiah, that is a time when literally like the Bible says that he – asked for help from Egypt, right? I mean, so like these kings are just before Hezekiah and with Hezekiah, they're, they're trying to stave off an invasion from the Assyrians. And they're like, they're looking for support from behind from the Egyptians. And, and so there probably was some kind of a, a union there, right? That kind of lasted for a while, but then it falls apart at, at, at some point. Right. Yeah. And, and so, but and, and like, there's been a lot of talk, like, I mean, this is, and this is like for hundreds of years, this idea that, um, that, that the idea of monotheism comes from Egypt. Right. And, and so that's, I mean, that, that's also one of those things where it's really hard to say whether or not there actually has been that kind of influence because it's at such an ideological level that we, we can't see it so clearly. Um, but, but again, that, that's like one possible way that we could see it in the in the realm of the divine um but but again it's not like the names of the gods just aren't there like i mean it's just we we see we see reflexes of so many more you know mesopotamian gods um than than you would expect if it was kind of divided evenly in the history between egyptian influence and mesopotamian influence yeah and I, I like to a lot of times people compare the monotheistic the Aten worship and say that's where it all came from yeah but, but then you also have the zoroastrians and ahura mazda but if i the more i look at that the, the zoroastrians they don't seem to be really pure monotheistic at all because they still have they still have mithra as the mediator they still yep. have Araman and they still have all these it seems like there's just it, it's not really pure monotheism it's just like a closer to it 
that means. Right. Yeah, but but I do think like chronologically that kind of monotheism or whatever we want to call it, henotheism or sure. whatever, like, because it's not, it's not, I mean, monotheism, I mean, what's that? Like, I don't believe most modern Christians are monotheists either. I don't think most, I don't think it, I, I mean, I think it's really hard to find somebody that could be like a pure monotheist that, that doesn't believe in any other kind of divine influence than, than the one soul God or whatever. And that's almost deism at that point. Cause now yeah, you're yeah. saying it all comes from one source. That's, you're almost you're almost outside of theism at that point, right? Right, and that's why it's such an, an um, it's such an anachronism to to kind of talk about monotheism at that point. But to say that there's like one high god that that is kind of more important or, or whatever than than all the others, and that everything else is subject to, then I think like Zoroastrianism actually provides a more chronologically relevant and geographically relevant parallel than the Aten stuff and the Egyptian stuff because it, it we, we just don't know and and that was also an older generation of biblical scholars that that would postulate that because they really wanted the Egyptian influence to be real yeah right because they're saying like Moses was there and he came and they would fight about whether it was 1400 or 1200 or whatever when Moses did this That's and difference. that Right, hundred years is a long time. Right, and yeah. where we're now, we're just kind of like, yeah, no. Right, um, no, that makes a lot of sense, especially yeah. when you look at how short-lived the Aten thing was. Yeah, Akhenaten did his thing, and then his son ruled, and that was it. That was the end of Aten. Exactly. It went right back to Osiris and Isis right after that. For the next exactly, time. and and that it was like it was so unpopular. Right. That that they were they were like deposed and and it and it disappeared. So it wasn't like it was a something that that the people wanted. It doesn't right. seem to be like a a massive success. And then everybody was like, "Man, I can't believe the king died." Now these other polytheistic kings are coming back. And it's like it yeah, it just didn't work like that. Right. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So so getting back to sort of these these sky father deities their yep. mythologies um what do you think is there any interesting things that you've noticed that most people aren't aware of maybe well so i can i can tell you about my favorite um of the uh, of the sumerian akkadian deities um like this one is like this is kind of like for me, this was like blow your mind kind of kind of thing um because there there's a so there's this story of of um, Anki or or the god uh, the god Anki or or Ea and and uh, the goddess Ninhursag, who are who's like the, she, uh, that means like the goddess of the holy mountain or something like that the sacred mountain but but so like they're kind of the primordial god parents in this in this story and and basically like there's this it's it's just this really it's a really weird story but so they like they they do their thing and they have a daughter and then like the goddess nin herself is out doing something and and then enki sees the daughter and thinks it's the mother and then like they do the thing and then there's a another daughter and they go through this like line where it just keeps happening and happening and happening right he, he keeps making new daughters with the one he thinks is is the, is the mother and and so like we it's it's really weird but then anyway so like they it ends up like um that they the 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 mother Ninhursag comes back and says, like, you have to wipe the seed of Anki off you. And and so she like wipes it off her. And then like these seven plants grow. And and so these seven plants, obviously seeds, right? It's a good like uh, play on words. And and so this this these seeds grow into trees or plants. And and so Anki comes around, he finds them, he's like, Oh, I want to eat that. And so he eats them and he becomes death. Uh, and then I don't don't remember if it's because of the plants or if it's because Nin Hursag gets really mad at him. But like anyway, he gets deathly ill. Like I think she gives him the evil eye, and then he he falls deathly ill. And and then like so she you know she runs off, and he's really really sick, and everybody's like, oh, you have to come and save him. And and so then she comes back to save him, and like kind of lays him in her lap, and starts to do this thing, and she creates like the the cool gods from him. Like by taking parts of him and and like fixing him, healing him, but then also to in order to save him, and and so like the god of beer and things like that shows up then. But one of the goddesses that is created is in um, in Sumerian is called Ninti, and Ninti um, is it, this is the by like, blow your head off kind of thing. It's like it's amazing. Um, so she is created 
by Nin Herzog removing one of Anki's ribs. Okay. Yeah. Oh no, we're not done yet, my friend. Oh, no. We're not done yet. And so, and so this Nin T is created, right? And she then has like the, you know, the healing power and it's part of this healing thing of, of Anki. Well, well, T in Sumerian means, means rib, right? And, and the Sumerian sign um, that we can, we can look at if you want um, is like, it's like, looks like an arrow and, and it points straight through. So it's this really cool sign. And, and it's also used for an, it's also used for arrow, but it's used for, for rib, but T has another meaning, which is giver of life. Wow. So Nin T in this myth is the lady of the rib who is the goddess who gives life. Wow. Now, when you then read Genesis. Genesis story, right? And we have the woman created from the rib and her name then is Chava, which literally in Hebrew means she who gives life. Like oh, giver of life, uh, yeah. It's like there's so much of this happening in the in the in the Hebrew yeah. Bible, yeah. And so, like the, the Semitic language itself comes from these same roots. So yeah. you have there is it's inescapable that you're going to have these sort of little puns happening. Exactly, and and like I mean, it's just so obvious that that this is playing on that mythology right that there's a that there is a an understanding of this underlying creation from the rib the god that is that is you know he, his salvation is in the in the removal of the rib and and then you have the giver of life and i mean it's just it's just so clear and and, and for me, it's just like, that was one of those things I remember like reading that the first time I read that, that myth and was just sitting there like, you know, why did, why didn't I read that in Sunday school? You know, like that's, that, that is, that's some cool stuff. It is. It is. Yeah. It actually makes the text more profound, I think. Yeah, definitely. They're, they're keeping their tradition going back to the beginning of, of all time. Like they're, yep. they're like, and they, and that's what they sort of, the text sort of makes you want to feel like. This book is from all the way back to Adam. And it's yeah. like, okay, but we know it's not. But then when you find out stuff like this, you're like, well, maybe they do have some sort of claim to the to the earliest days of history because they're holding on to these stories and they're repurposing them. I think it makes it better. I think it's something that people should be proud of if they're of their uh text if that makes sense yeah well and i mean it's 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 an amazing literary accomplishment i yeah. like i mean to say that like like Literally, that yeah. to take that kind of myth and reframe it and then make it into part of the story of of where your people come from right that's like that is exactly what what i think is cool like that reception of it and transformation of it into being my story or our story instead of just being that story out there. And so it's obviously crafted, right? And so like, I mean, it's all fake. It's all made up, right. but, but it's, it's made, at least then it's made up for us or whatever, you know? And like, it makes it much cooler. Yeah. Now you, now you back to that story. That's fascinating. You said there were mm -hmm. seven, seven deities created out of this. Yes. What are the, what are the other ones? If you, if you do you remember or no, I, I, I do remember some of them. Let me see. Um, so, so there's the goddess of beer um, is is my favorite. <laughs> That's, That's Nin Nin Kasi is her, is her name. Um, I think so. Yeah, one one of them is called Abu, which means father, and and oh, wow. that is the that's the the god of of like growth and and plants and stuff like that. Um, then you have, um, I think there's like the god of um, so there's the god of of like um, what do you call them like smiths like blacksmiths or metal workers or whatever. Um, you have the goddess of healing, um, and then there is the uh, oh. What, do you remember I, the name of the heal, healing goddess by by any chance? So no. there's there. Um, I think it's Nin Situ. Um, so. Um, yeah, that's like so. Sit, sit, situ would be her her title. Like Nin, 
is is the word for goddess or or i mean it means lady or, or that's how it's usually translated but it means like it means goddess so um yeah um and then yeah so but i think also there's the the goddess um Az, 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 azimu or something like that azimu uh, who is who's also a god of healing but who is the she, so her i think she's like the consort of the the god of the of the dead or of the the nether world or whatever so like there's yeah there's a whole like there's a whole pile of mythologies there and and like n these aren't necessarily the most well known or the most like um like integrated of the of the myths right but like they're they're part of of this story anyway. Like it's it, it's an important part of that that kind of creation epic. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Now that's now, and you mentioned how the the names can mean two different things. Mm, yeah. And I talked to some other people about this too. It seems like the Sumerians really had a thing with puns. Well, I think I think it. Yeah, I mean, definitely, you see it in their in their literary works, but like, I think it's also a product of the so the structure of the language and the writing system, because like the the language is we don't know it hundred. I mean, we don't know hundred percent sure how Sumerian actually was. We we have some ideas, but like, it's written in cuneiform, which is which is not uh, an alphabet. It's it's either logograms which are just word by word or they're syllables and so like you you don't always know exactly how the language would have been spoken but the the writing at least reflects some of the words and the ways they they would have been like we we got a pretty good idea but it's not like it, we, we don't always know everything but like you will get things like this where there obviously must have been homophones in the language like with t where it could mean uh, uh, rib or life and and so like it seems like that this combination between trying to use symbols to to show like as few symbols as possible to cover all the consonants and all the words and and all this kind of stuff that there were associations made that like it it looks like that and so we'll call it that but you could also say that it looks like that and so it gets that value as well and and so you get kind of these things that are very close and and like when you get into later Akkadian, so Sumerian's older, but then Akkadian comes and takes over the writing system and takes over a ton of the words. Um, but like Akkadian's a completely different language. And so what happens in Akkadian right. is you get scribes that do this crazy stuff where they will choose the way they write things in Akkadian uh, so that they can play on what the Sumerian word behind the symbol means. And so you get these like ridiculous puns. Like, I mean, it's at a whole another level. And, um, wow. and, and they, I mean, it's, so it's, it's like, it is, it, there's some stuff that's just like, I mean, it is really advanced and they really knew what they were doing. And so that's like, for me, even more confirmation why things like this Eve and, and Ninti kind of thing, like it's, it's not a stretch for an ancient scribe to do that, a Mesopotamian scribe. And so if you have these Judean scribes that have learned Babylonian and they would have learned these tales, they would have learned to write like this and they could have easily done that kind of pun. Yeah, I know one of them I noticed recently, I was doing a video on the god Eshmon, the Phoenician mm -hmm. god. And from what I found out that the, the, well, I, I know a little bit of Hebrew, so I already knew that the number eight is, is Shimone. Yeah. But the word shmon by itself, without the e, at, well, without the a at the end, it means oil. Yeah. So shmon, sh, sh, shmon is like a, a a name that means oil or a, the eighth. So he's right. like pun on he because he he's a healer. He uses oil, and then he's yep. also the eighth, the eighth son of Sadat Sidak or whatever his name is. Yeah. So like, they're doing that. The Phoenicians are still doing that, and they're, yep. so, and they're not too far from the Judeans. They're sort of probably using the same sort of. Uh, tactics of scribe how the scribes do their thing you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah definitely and and i mean and again like i said earlier like that's like that's how we have to read the hebrew bible like the hebrew bible is a is a product of canaan 
in the in the Iron Age that's heavily influenced by Mesopotamian culture. So, like, I mean, so the Phoenicians, their their language is very very similar to to Hebrew. It's, I mean, Hebrew is a Hebrew is a dialect of Canaanite that that came into being in the late Bronze Age, so 14, 13, 1200, sometime like that. And and the oldest like Hebrew inscriptions, like you'll see people talking about, oh, we found the oldest Hebrew inscriptions, or whatever. It's probably Canaanite. Like, I mean, yeah. we're because we get to a point where it's too early to be Hebrew. And and like that was also one of those moments that like my head exploded when I when I was studying Semitics and like we started working with historical linguistics and we're like, we you get to that point where you're like, yeah, and Hebrew doesn't exist before this point. And and you're just like, wait, what? What and and like then before that it's Canaanite right and and so you start reading these Canaanite inscriptions and it's like oh yeah that that's really easy to understand like you have this vocal sh- the vowel shift or you have some changes and slightly different forms and stuff like that but it's like you, you just get it and 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 then as we work backwards you know you get like Ugaritic which is you know obviously pre Hebrew. Canaanite. And I mean, it's, it's, it's up on the coast of, of um, Syria or Lebanon up there, but it's so close in terms of culture, in terms of language that it's like, it's so easy to understand. And, and like one of the first like really big biblical scholars that got into Ugaritic, uh, Mitchell Dahud wrote this commentary on the Psalms where he basically just says like every, every word almost has a footnote that says, uh, this is Ugaritic, this is Ugaritic, this is Ugaritic. And it's like, it's such a fun commentary because he sees Canaanite stuff everywhere. Wow. And and like to the point that people would, I mean, like if he was uh, a present day, he would get memes made up about him, about being the the Ugaritic guy, the Canaanite guy. But like it's, it's and so it's a little overkill, but it's it's definitely makes you aware that that the Hebrew Bible is is Canaanite. Sure. It's, it's, it's just, that's where it fits in. And yeah. so they are doing the same kind of things with the, with the words. And, and like, and we see it when, when you get like the folk etymology for, for Yahweh, right? I mean, when you read, when you read why Yahweh is Yahweh, the, the reason for it is because of what he says to Moses, right? Where it says, um, um, uh, Asher, uh, 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 yeah, um, yeah, it's uh, he like he says, um, uh, which means I am that which I am, or I am who I am, right? And and so it's, but what it is is it's a funny thing because it's he uses a first person verb and says like I am uh, who I am or what I am, um, but then in the next verse he says and by the name Yahweh you will know me. And that's a third person verb. And so it's like, takes the the grammar of the language and says, oh, when I talk about myself, obviously I would use the first person form of my verbal name. But when you talk about me, you have to use the third person form of my name. And so Yahweh is a third person verb. And so it's just like, it's, it's playing on how they understand the name. As right. saying, that's when correct. God uses it in his own mouth, it's first person, obviously, duh. Yeah. Now, when I started to learn a little bit of Hebrew, I found out Ani means I am. Yep. So is there a different, is Yahweh being I am who I am? Where is that? How does that split up like that? Is this an ancient version of Hebrew somehow that's, and Ani is a new version of Hebrew? Is that what that is? Well, I mean, Ani means I, like, oh. it's like the person, like the first person personal pronoun. Um, but, but it, so in, in Hebrew, like there's, you don't need a verb to be to say something. So, like, you could say "ani who," like in modern Hebrew, like "I am," that I, am, yeah, that's me, like, uh, yeah, something like that, like, and uh, and that's um, so you can use the first personal pronoun to predicate a sentence like that and say that uh, that's me, like, uh, and but when when God does it, <laughs> it's like it's it, there is this there's a, a verb for being. Um, or like happen or to be or to, you know, something like that. And that's the verb that's used. And, and so then like in the form that, that Yahweh probably is, is like the causative form of that, which means like to come into being or to make become or something like that. And, uh, and so that's like, 
again, that's like the the one who makes things be uh, or something like that. And that that is a verb that you can conjugate in Hebrew, but that's uh, it's a little different than the than the use of the pronoun. I got you. Now, the last thing I want to ask you about. Yeah, I, I'm so glad I remembered this is that you got these 12 tribes and Asher's one of them. Gad's one of them. And I've noticed and I, I know I'm not like too I'm not an expert on this, but I'm from a little bit of research that some of these names are deities to the Canaanite pantheon. Yep. Do you know much about this? Like, or can you tell us a little bit about this or Asher, well, for example? Yeah, I mean, so that's basically what you said. Like that, there's, I mean, Asher is the is the kind of big example that it's yeah. it An obvious seem, one. it yeah. seems like the base. I mean, so again, we have to like like I mean, I it depends on where you are, like with all the historical stuff, how much you know about it. But like, I mean. For me, obviously, like the the twelve tribes are construction that are that are that are made kind of uh, in in later times. Um, there probably were some tribal affiliations, things like that. But like these, this idea of twelve sons that then become the twelve tribes is like a, a retro version of of stuff that that's just done much later. And then they it's it's legends that become myths that become something, and they they go back to these people is individual people right and so i don't i don't think they existed in that way and so like that's that for me is like um starting point number one like we we have to kind of be there where like then why did they get the names that they got exactly. um and and that is something i'm really interested in is is why why names are given in in the way they are because like you know, one thing is deities, right? That these etymologies and the kind of different ways deities get names. But like, if we really think about it, the characters of Genesis are also deities or legendary figures in exactly the same way as the right. heroes are in in Greek mythology. Yeah. So I would say, like, I mean, Adam, uh, you know, Adam is definitely just like a proto man that is that is, you know, they. I mean, of course, uh, up to Abraham, they all live to be you know, six, seven, eight hundred years old. And, you know, we have, so Adam does all this. I mean, he's the first man. And then you have Enoch who flies around with the angels and doesn't die. And then you get Noah who like, floats around in the ark. And we, so we get these hero legendary people that are, that correspond to, you know, like Hercules or, or whatever that are kind of like have some humanness to them, but that still do cool things. And like, we've got the heroes. So it's, it's, it makes sense. And like, so when earlier generations have looked at that thing and like, especially like more conservative biblical scholars or older biblical scholars, that was kind of like, after you get to Abraham, then they think differently about the characters of the story. Right. They would say like, oh, well, from Abraham, we have some real legendary kernels or whatever that we can look back to. So Abraham, I, I mean, even though most people say Abraham wasn't maybe a real guy, they would think, but there's something and and that something has always been really hard to define because people want there to be something, but they can't really put a finger on it. But but I mean, his name is like his name is literally Big Daddy. Like right. I mean, so like I mean, he's it's. it's I, like, I I wonder if his he represents a time period, like he might represent the age. Abraham represents the age when people came out of the city of Ur and started to populate the the west, the west. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as a literary figure, sure, why not? Like, but but he also like I I think like I think we have to be careful in in imagining that ancient writers and readers thought that what they were doing was only figurative, sure. because like I think there may very well have been an idea that there was a man sure. that that went and that they just gave him a name, and right. so like they thought somebody must have gone there from here or whatever. And 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 they gave him a name, and they call it, this happened to call him Father you know, Big, Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, Big Big Daddy. The the the. I mean, that's that's what his name means. I mean, Abram yeah. means means large father, or, you know, father of great extent or something. You know, it's just it like literally does mean that. Yeah, yeah. It literally means that. So it's like it, I mean, it's, it's 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 just the way it is. Um, but but so when when Abraham, but but. The, and the point is that, like, it makes sense when you're thinking, how did he become the father of so many? And then you're like, what are we going to call this guy? Well, let's call him father of many or, or you know, the, the big father, big daddy, whatever. And, and so we, we've got this Abraham and, and then – but the story about him 
it 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 it, it makes so much sense if you are in captivity in Babylon. Right. Right? Because what does he do? He's in Babylonia and, he leaves, and he among the, the polytheists or whatever, and he gets a message from God to leave behind his family, leave behind the nation he lives in, and he will get this land that that is promised to him, and he will be able to settle there. And And I mean, who wants to hear that? Like, obviously people that are stuck in captivity in Babylonia, that's the message they want to hear. Right. So this story speaks so much better to those people, right, than to any other time. And and so like the the Abraham's right might have some elements that are that are a lot older, probably has a whole big mixture of of stuff, but like then you get like Isaac and Jacob that are are basically just like also legendary figures that are explaining things like as to why things are the way they are. Like right. Like Jacob is literally the guy who wrestles with God and then is called Israel. And like it's he like there that's the point in the story where we can say, oh, okay, that's why we're called Israel. Right? And then you get these 12 tribes that are like there is definitely some of them that have a lot of historical evidence. Like we we see um we see in inscriptions for like Ephraim and Judah um, that we get, we get some information about some of the names, but then like others of them, they're, they're, they're just there in the Bible. And so it seems like there's, like you said, like, like um, they're just maybe reflections of local, like either tribes or local God names or a combination of the two. So if I'm not mistaken, there was a god named Gad who was the god of luck. He was like the the, yep. the fortune would be the Latin version, Fortuna. Yep. But there was Gad in Canaan, and he was yep. the fortune god. Yep. So all of a sudden you have a tribe of Gad, when it's like, wait a minute, wouldn't, wouldn't they know this? Don't they know that there's a god named? Why would yep. they name their tribe that? Why? Would, but like, so like it makes you wonder if they're taking these localized gods and just trying to bring them down to a level that's you know good enough for their religion. Right. Or, or just that it wasn't a problem right? at the point that this story was at that stage in its development, like that, that no one said, wait, there's a God name in here. Asher too. Yeah. Or Asher. Yeah. Asher and God and Gad, like, what are we going to do? We got to rid. No, I mean like that it, it, it didn't pose a problem. It didn't sure. pose a threat. Yeah. And and if they worship the gods there, then I I don't think that posed much of a threat either because everyone else was out there worshiping their Asherah poles and Baal and everything else too. So it I I I think like it's the the modern construction of of an of a monotheistic Israel that causes a lot of the confusion. So like the idea that Israel was monotheistic all the time that Abraham was the first monotheist and that like after him, everybody was purely monotheistic or something like that. Like there's, there's just like, there, there's no real evidence for that. And, and then it just confuses us when we read the text, when we're trying to make it a basically monotheistic setting and then interpret why these elements show up that are polytheistic. And so if we turn it around and say, Oh, it's polytheistic place that's that's the world then it makes it much easier yeah um the last thing i have uh, this is the i promise this is the last thing yeah no worries the the word the word levi for the levites because this, this seems like to be the chosen tribe to be the priests and they're they're the mm. special ones and where, where does, is there anything going on with the name levi that goes back to maybe the sumerians or akkadian or anything or is, or is this just an, a hebrew thing um, like they're the chosen of the chosen. It's like why? Yeah, I guess right. that depends. They they are the tribe of Moses, but then why did they make that the tribe that Moses came from? You know what I mean? So, yeah, ex exactly. And and I mean, but but the one thing we can say is that the Levites, like we do, definitely know of for a long period of time. Like they're they're there at least through the Second Temple period, and and so that them being reconstructed as its own tribe 
where you have this group of people that are considered the priestly group, that they also get their own tribe, and that tribe happens to be the tribe of Moses and Aaron and all this. Like that is like could be because there is a group of people known that like as the servants of the temple or whatever that call themselves Levites, that then you kind of reconstruct it backwards in that way. That makes sense. Um, yeah. But, but like the other, um, the other thing that's interesting is, I mean, there's, cause there's two people, there's two sons that are important, right? So there's, there's um, Levi and then there's, there's Judah. Right. Right, because Judah is is also like incredibly is cred- incredibly important um, uh, as I mean, obviously as he becomes the you know the ancestor of David and the and the monarchies and, then and so the, map of the twelve tribes Levi is housed within Judah, so they're sort of they sort of work together if it makes if that makes right sense. yeah and like and so there's like so what you can. What you can see by that is is that we have like a very very small area that is the main center of focus for the texts. Right. And it's like everything else is is outside this realm, and and I think that's like one of the one of the things that is also a problem when we're reading texts that that describe uh, uh, an assumed historical reality. You know, say like, oh, the kingdom under David was this big, and it went from there to there, and it was like this and this. But like, many scholars today like basically agree that that's like that never existed. Like, no, no kingdom of that size was really there. Like, right. I mean, somebody might have been to that place on a you know on a walk once or on a you know whatever. But like, there's it's not a it's not a real like controlled place and like so the size of the kingdom you know might might represent the idealized desired kingdom or something like that and so like a lot of these tribes are among the tribes that just don't feature in the rest of the story right and and so like their their function is to make that 12 like they they're there just to be a part of the 12 but they're not there to actually play a role and then like and we also see this weird thing where like sometimes the, the all these other tribes are called israel sometimes they're called ephraim um so you know sometimes they're called samaria and so like samaria was the capital and and ephraim is coming that kind of becomes the name of the northern kingdom in some of the texts and and israel then is used for the northern kingdom in opposition to judah but then, like later, it seems like Israel sometimes gets used for the whole shebang, like for the everything. It's just—it's just, yeah. such a confusing. It uh, is really confusing. It is yeah. a good point. Yeah, it is. But it's fun to talk about, and um, this has been a great conversation. We're definitely going to do this again soon. Yeah, great. Um, I, I want. Do you have anything you want to promote for people? Any links you want to? Uh, I'll put it in the description. Yeah, no, I, you know, I don't have anything that is, I mean, people can, you, we, we can look at my academia site and whatever, I've like some articles I've written, but I don't know if those will be like popular among the uh, people that don't read all the weird languages I throw in there. But I mean, people are welcome to check that out, but I don't have anything like out there at the moment, but um, yeah, hopefully sometime not, not too far future, I'll have something to work with. So awesome. Well, this has been great. And you have just attained true gnosis. <laughs> You have just attained True Gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over.